building client portfolio and cross selling so firstly we will understand the meaning of portfolio and cross selling a portfolio is an appropriate mix or collection of investments held by an institution or an individual holding a portfolio is a part of an investment and risk limiting strategy called diversification by owning several assets certain types of risk can be reduced the assets in the portfolio could include bank accounts stocks bonds options warrants gold certificates real estate future contracts production facilities or any other item that is expected to retain its value in building up an investment portfolio a financial institution will typically conduct its own investment analysis while a private individual may make use of the services of a financial advisor or a financial institution which offers portfolio management services cross selling is defined as the action or practice of selling among or between established clients market traders etc or that of selling an additional product or service to an existing customer in practice businesses define cross selling in many different ways elements that might influence the definition might include the size of the business the industry sector it operates within and the financial motivations of those required to define the term we will study both the concepts in detail in further discussion after studying this lesson we should be able to understand the problems in portfolio selection analyze the way in which portfolio is selected and managed discuss the concept of cross selling enumerate the tips for successful cross selling now let's discuss portfolio in detail to understand this we should discuss four concepts which are portfolio selection problem selection of optimal portfolio diversification portfolio strategies so firstly we move on to portfolio selection problem as the word says that is it is something related to the problem of making choice among the various alternatives to invest we consider the problem of selecting a portfolio of assets that provides the investor a suitable balance of expected return and risk each one of these portfolios available for investment corresponds to a set of portfolio weights that is the proportions of fund that investors may allocate to different assets and is characterized by an expected rate of return and variance or standard deviation it is assumed that investors are risk averse meaning that given two portfolios that offer the same expected return investors will prefer the less risky one thus an investor will take on increased risk only if compensated by higher expected returns conversely an investor who wants higher expected returns must accept more risk after that on the above basis we move on to finally selecting one or two or three alternatives as we think we can invest as per risk return trade offer that is selection of optimal portfolio portfolio selection process entails four basic steps identifying the assets to be considered for portfolio construction generating the necessary input data to portfolio selection this involves estimating the expected returns variances and covariance for all the assets considered delineating the efficient portfolio given an investor's risk tolerance level selecting the optimal portfolio in terms of a the assets to be held b the proportion of available funds to be allocated to each now let's try and understand diversification diversification in finance means reducing risk by investing in a variety of assets if the asset values do not move up and down in perfect synchrony a diversified portfolio will have less risk than the weighted average risk of its constituent assets often less risk than the least risky of its constituents 
Therefore, any risk-averse investor will diversify to at least some extent with more risk-averse investors, diversifying more completely than less risk-averse investors. Diversification is one of the two general techniques for reducing investment risk. The simplest example of diversification is provided by the proverb, Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Dropping the basket will break all the eggs. Placing each egg in a different basket is more diversified. There is more risk of losing one egg, but less risk of losing all of them. In finance, an example of an undiversified portfolio is to hold only one stock. This is risky. It is not unusual for a single stock to go down 50% in one year. It is much less common for a portfolio of 20 stocks to go down that much, even if they are selected at random. If the stocks are selected from a variety of industries, company sizes and types, it is still less likely. Further diversification can be obtained by investing in stocks from different countries and in different asset classes such as bonds, real estate and commodities like heating oil or gold. There is one more concept called portfolio strategies. There are two types of strategies. Passive strategy, active strategy. Passive strategy is the practice of a money manager or a team of money managers making investment decisions on what securities to include in a fund or portfolio and then leaving those securities largely unchanged for a significant period of time. To give a very simple example, an investment manager may buy every stock on the Dow Jones Industrial Average and hold them for a period of 5 or 10 years. Passive investment managers seek a well-diversified set of securities. It is a strategy that involves minimal expectation input and instead relies on diversification to match the performance of some market index. A passive strategy assumes that the marketplace will reflect all available information in the price paid for securities and therefore does not attempt to find mispriced securities. In an active portfolio strategy, a manager uses financial and economic indicators along with various other tools to forecast the market and achieve higher gains than a buy and hold passive portfolio. Although not always the case, some active portfolio strategies will include passive techniques such as dollar cost averaging and reinvesting dividends. Dollar cost averaging is a technique designed to reduce market risk through the systematic purchase of securities at predetermined intervals and set amounts. Instead of investing assets in a lump sum, the investor works his way into a position by slowly buying smaller amounts over a longer period of time. This spreads the cost basis out over several years, providing insulation against changes. After discussing this all, now we can understand what optimal portfolio is. Portfolio in which the risk-reward combination is such that it yields the maximum returns, that is, provide the highest utility possible under the current and anticipated circumstances, is called optimal portfolio. Its mathematical formulation was provided by the University of California's Nobel laureate economist Harry Markowitz in 1952. Also known as an efficient portfolio, an optimal portfolio is a collection of assets that are adequately helping an investor to reach his or her financial goals. A portfolio of this type is configured to include assets that the investor feels comfortable with and that carry a level of risk that fits in well with the overall investment strategy that the investor employs. Determining whether or not a portfolio is efficient or optimal is somewhat subjective since what is a good fit for one investor may or may not serve the needs of a different investor with equal ability. In order to determine if a portfolio is truly optimal, it is important to look closely at investor preferences and goals. 
This often involves assessing the general approach of the investor to finance in general. Someone who is very conservative with money may be highly uncomfortable with the purchase of assets that carry a high rate of volatility. When this is the case, the optimal portfolio design will be to acquire assets that carry less risk but that still offer the best return possible for that level of volatility. For investors who are willing to take more chances, a collection of somewhat conservative and lower yielding assets would likely be unacceptable. When this is the case, the optimal portfolio will focus on the acquisition of stocks, commodities and other investments that provide the opportunity for a higher rate of return. While the opportunity to earn higher returns is present, the investments are also more volatile, which increases the possibility of incurring some losses along the way. The chart in the slide illustrates how the optimal portfolio works. The optimal risk portfolio is usually determined to be somewhere in the middle of the curve because as you go higher up the curve, you take on proportionately more risk for a lower incremental return. On the other end, low risk or low return portfolios are pointless because you can achieve a similar return by investing in risk-free assets like government securities. Many investors find that an optimal portfolio will include a range of investment options. The idea is that including several different types of investments helps to balance the portfolio in such a way that incurring a loss is less likely. For example, some would consider an optimal portfolio strategy to be the inclusion of a mixture of stocks with low, medium and high rates of volatility, several bond issues and a commodity or two. When one type of investment is experiencing some degree of downturn, the other types provide stability to the portfolio with gains in the other sectors offsetting any losses in the one area. The best way to develop an optimal portfolio is to work closely with a broker who can help an investor create the ideal investment strategy. This may take some time as the broker and the investor learn how to work together and as the investor becomes more familiar with what types of investments he or she is comfortable authorizing. With attention to detail and taking into consideration the factor of investor preference, it is possible to build the ideal portfolio that strikes the balance between risk and return and helps the investor reach his or her financial goals. After discussing how optimal portfolio can be made, let's discuss how risk reduction can be obtained in the stock portion of a portfolio. One among them is Law of Large Numbers. Assume that all risk sources in a portfolio of securities are independent. As we add securities to this portfolio, the exposure to any particular source of risk becomes small. According to the law of large numbers, the larger the sample size, the more likely it is that the sample mean will be close to the population expected value. Risk reduction in the case of independent risk sources can be thought of as the insurance principle named for the idea that an insurance company reduces its risk by writing many policies against many independent sources of risk. Second method is a strategy for everyone. We have demonstrated a superior investment strategy. Looking forward, our strategy should yield superior results while limiting risk for long-term investors in almost any economic environment short of unlimited nuclear war or total global economic collapse. Whether you are playing tennis, flying fighters or practicing medicine, you should be constantly looking for the highest probability shot. The combination of strategic global asset allocation and modern portfolio theory offers investors the highest probability shot of making their objectives a reality. Now the turn comes to discuss the different styles of investment. There are three types of investment style which are value investing, growth investing, performance index. Value investing is the strategy of selecting stocks that trade for less than their intrinsic values. Value investors actively seek stocks of companies 
that they believe the market has undervalued. They believe the market overreacts to good and bad news, resulting in stock price movements that do not correspond with the company's long-term fundamentals. The result is an opportunity for value investors to profit by buying when the price is deflated. Typically, value investors select stocks with lower than average price to book or price to earnings ratios and or high dividend yields. This style of investing termed as conservative investing. Growth investing is a style of investment strategy. Those who follow this style known as growth investors invest in companies that exhibit signs of above average growth even if the share price appears expensive in terms of metrics such as price to earnings or price to book ratios. In typical usage, the term growth investing contrasts with the strategy known as value investing. It is a strategy whereby an investor seeks out stocks with what they deem good growth potential. In most cases, a growth stock is defined as a company whose earnings are expected to grow at an above average rate compared to the industry or the overall market. Growth investors often call growth investing a capital growth strategy since investors seek to maximize their capital gains. Next one is the performance index which measures performance at the individual department division and or company level as perceived by peers, subordinates, customers, vendors and superiors. The application of PI results can be used in coaching, building relationships, setting objectives and identifying training and development issues. It is any measure of the performance of a portfolio or fund with adjustments made for how risky it is. Portfolio performance is evaluated over a specific time period. The most often used risk adjusted portfolio performance measures are Sharpe's Portfolio Performance Measure, Trainer Portfolio Performance Measure, Jensen Portfolio Performance Measure. Another concept to study is cross-selling. Cross-selling is a very simple sales technique. If you have made a sale to a customer and you have other products they may be interested in, it's simply selling them the additional products too. The idea behind cross-selling is to capture a larger share of the consumer market by meeting more of the needs and wants of each individual customer. Cross-selling generally refers to selling items that are related or can be integrated with the item being sold. Rather than simply trying to get as much out of the customer as possible, cross-selling can be a demonstration that you understand and care about their needs and can suggest other items that will help them. In terms of the benefits, it is a very time and labor efficient way of selling as the customer already has the trust in you as a salesperson and a business. Most businesses know how much it costs to acquire a new customer, so cross-selling has significant cost savings. And for the customer, it can often be better to limit their dealings to as few providers as possible. So if you offer another product or service they need, it can be beneficial for them too. Progressive companies understand the power of cross-selling and recognize it as a critical component for promoting both customer retention and revenue growth. Cross-selling is pursued by banks also. Selling of bank products or services to an already existing customer is the broad definition of what cross-sell means. It can be selling an existing checking account customer a credit card or selling an existing credit card customer a mortgage. Banks have also been using cross-sell as a marketing approach to expand their footprint and also increase their customer base. For many banks pursuing a lost leader strategy, cross-sell becomes a strategic imperative. If you attract customers with free checking in the hopes of getting other business from those customers, failure to cross-sell means losses. As well, some banks forgot that the objective was profit, not a higher cross-sell. Many tactics merely increase cross-sell, not profit. Offering discounts for additional products and services, but at the cost of foregone revenue results in losses. 
Even when the paradox is recognized, the losses are often justified by the assumption of higher retention leading to a higher lifetime value. But that makes little sense if the customer is losing money for the bank every year. Successful cross-selling requires that you understand what your customers need and that you keep track of their interactions. Customers do not want their data abused by banks merely interested in exploiting the data to more intensively cross-selling. They will, however, appreciate a bank that does not try to sell them the same product again and again. It's also important to keep track of interactions across channels. If the customer declines an offer at the call centers, there's no point in offering the same product when he or she visits your website. That would be the equivalent of telling them that they are data to us, not an individual. Simpler technology tools and strategies are required. These include easy-to-use referral and sales call tracking systems, complete activity management, single entry, multi-carrier quotation systems, simple CRM, scalable and flexible agency management systems, more web-based systems and an increasingly paperless environment, and reporting and audit tools that enable banks to meet compliance responsibilities of sales supervision. However, we must constantly remind ourselves that technology is a tool, not a product. Its end purpose is to serve, not enslave. The goal is a steady stream of referrals, sales activities, and new and renewal sales volumes that meet banks' monthly goals. Key to active support for cross-selling is installing a widespread program of employee training that enhances identification of insurance prospects and insurance needs, compliance with bank insurance laws and regulations, and fully integrated sales efforts. Performance appraisals should measure employees' referral performance, and salary reviews and bonuses should be, at least in part, predicated upon satisfactory referral activities. Now let us check if we have understood the various concepts discussed in this lesson clearly. A portfolio is an appropriate mix of shares and debentures held by an investor individually. Right or wrong? Wrong. Cross-selling is a sales technique of selling an additional product or service to an existing customer. Right or wrong? Right. Diversification means reducing risk by investing in a variety of assets. Right or wrong? Right. Passive strategy is the practice of a money manager making investment decisions on what securities to include in a portfolio and then leaving those securities unchanged for one year. Right or wrong? Wrong. Let's revise. Portfolio means a collection or combination of financial assets such as shares, debentures, and government securities. Diversification is a risk management technique that mixes a wide variety of investments within a portfolio in order to minimize the impact of risk of your portfolio. The optimal portfolio concept falls under the modern portfolio theory. The theory assumes that investors fanatically try to minimize risk while striving for the highest return possible. Sources of information about securities are numerous on the World Wide Web. Most investment techniques involve an active approach to investing. In the area of common stocks, the use of valuation models to value and select stocks indicates that investors are analyzing and valuing stocks in an attempt to improve their performance relative to some benchmarks such as a market index. While cross-selling is often a highly desirable activity for both the seller and the buyer, it is not without some degree of risk. In the event that one of the additional goods or services does not live up to the consumer's expectations, the negative experience could color the perception of the customer in regard to the other purchased products. Banks have been using cross-sell as a marketing approach to expand their footprint and also increase their customer base. 